afternoon. So this is COVID-19 return to work risk assessments. As Alan says, um, this is our repeat session for Glasgow Chamber of Commerce, also delivered this session um, in a few other places. But as the situation is changing so, so quickly, I've had to keep updating it every time, so um, bear with me a little bit. Uh, so a little bit of introduction to myself. I am manager of the process safety team at Mabbit & Associates. We are a safety, environment and engineering consultancy based out of Glasgow. Uh, typically my role, I work across a whole wide range of high hazard industries, everything from food and drink and spirit manufacture to pharmaceuticals and energy. Um, but recently, as I'm sure as everyone else's, my focus has been on the COVID-19 pandemic and the requirement for employers to manage risk and protect their workers. So through this, I have delivered some COVID-19 risk assessments for a variety of different workplaces. And I've also been working with different operational sites to see how they are actually managing their COVID-19 measures going forward. So as Alan says, any questions, pop them in the chat box. I'll do a stop at about the halfway point just to give you a wee break from my voice for a second. And then again, at the end, we'll have a, a, another Q&A. Um, if there's anything I'm unable to answer within the session, I'll take your email and I'll, I'll get back to you after the session. Okay, so format for today, we'll look back at the story so far, what's happened over the last few months, what guidance has been released, what guidance has been available. And then uh, we'll talk about the guidance for working safely during COVID-19, which is the UK government guidance, but we'll also talk about the Scottish specific guidance within that. We'll have a look at heating and ventilation specifically and other non-COVID restart issues you might have. We'll then look at what's next, what happens once you've done your risk assessment, what's the next steps for you if you're responsible for this type of assessment, and then we'll do a Q&A. Okay, so story so far, we'll be too far there. So on the 23rd of March, due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, the UK government announced social distancing measures and ordered, ordered certain non-essential premises to close, essentially putting the UK on lockdown. But the UK government required only selected businesses to close by law, the Scottish government took things a step further. The First Minister asked businesses to decide for themselves if their activity was critical to the fight against COVID-19, if they were essential. As a result of these measures or other steps taken by individual employers, many companies stopped operations or moved staff to home working. And then on the 7th of April, the UK government published sector guidance for businesses in England who had continued to trade. The guidance laid out the principles of social distancing, hygiene and workforce management that we'll talk about today. The guidance for um, sorry, there. So the guidance laid out the principles for social distancing, hygiene and workforce management and that guidance would then inform the working safely during COVID-19 guides which were released just about a month later on the 11th of May. The Working Safely During COVID-19 guides were written with input from companies, industry bodies and the devolved administrations in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, as well as consultation with Public Health England and the Health and Safety Executive, the HSE. However, they are applicable for England as the main audience for these guides. So then on the 21st of May, the First Minister announced Scotland's route map through and out of the crisis. The document describes a five phase approach to lifting the restrictions in Scotland, both for businesses as well as all other aspects of daily life from social interactions, transport, education, healthcare. The roadmap advised that in phase one, some outdoor work could commence and construction could begin to implement the restart plan. During this phase one time, other industries which would be opening in the later phases can start their preparation activities can start to think, think about risk assessment and think about preparing for getting back to work. Phase two then commenced on the 29th of June um, with further changes to come into force on the 3rd of July, 6th of July and phase three beginning to happen on the 10th of July. I'll now show you on the next slide how that's been broken down a little bit further. So let's say we entered phase two on Monday 29th of June at that time, some businesses were able to restart, which were mainly outdoor. And then other, um, other, other indoor non-office based workplaces were able to resume activities. Moving on to hospitality and other businesses beginning to operate as of today, the 6th of July. And then moving into phase three, we can see things continue to open up. But as you can see, that guidance has evolved even since the last time I delivered this webinar a month ago. Uh, the phase plan that was 
announced by the Scottish Government has also changed since the first issue. So it can be a little bit tricky to keep up to date with where we are now. So I've added a big red arrow here to say we are here at the moment. Um, you can start thinking about your indoor, non-office based workplaces can resume activities apart from those which can open in phase three. Okay. So what relevant guidance is there at this time? They said the UK government released the Working Safely During COVID-19 Guides, which are specific to individual industries. So here's an example of the factories, plants and warehouses and others for shops and branches. They've also updated it to include the visitor economy recently. Now, these guides are, provide some pretty good, pretty prescriptive guidance on risk assessment process and what measures you should put in place from social distancing, hygiene and workforce management. The Scottish Government has also released a whole host of different guidance documents for various industries from manufacturing, tourism, hospitality. These guides include checklists which employers can use to audit their own assessments. So here's an example of a checklist from the manufacturing guidance, an example from the hospitality guidance. The reason why I'll be talking about the both of them is I think the the, the Scottish Government guidance is sometimes a little bit more difficult to navigate, it's a little bit more disjointed in some cases. Um, however, the um, UK Government is, is quite prescriptive and their guides quite clearly laid out, so I'll, I'll often refer to them as the basis and, and refer to the Scottish Government in addition to that. And I would say as well that the HSE has also provided additional guidance, so they have provided their working safely during coronavirus outbreak which provides some overview of how you should approach your risk assessment. And just recently, they've also published an example risk assessment, which you can use um, to guide you through how you might want to lay out your risk assessment, uh, what controls you should be considering. Um, they're, they're very clear, clear within their guidance that you shouldn't be using this as a, like, a copy paste. It should be used as the basis and it should be specific for your individual um, company or workplace. And as I'll say again, the guidance is dynamic. The UK uh, government guidance for factories, which I mentioned, has been updated four times already since it was first issued. So if you have looked at this guidance perhaps a month ago when you first started to think about your risk assessment, it's very much worth revisiting that guidance again just to confirm you haven't missed anything major. Okay. Yep, so that's a, what I mean about dynamic. This is the list of the... Um, revision uh, record of the um, factories and warehouses guide, uh, first published on 11th of May and then re-released on the 14th of June and then again the 24th of June and then again on the 3rd of July. Okay. Okay, so I'll now go through the Working Safely guides in some detail um, as I think they kind of quite clearly explain the process that you may need to take if you're responsible for carrying out a risk assessment in your workplace. Um, the guides themselves are split up into eight main sections. Each section lays out an objective and steps that you usually need to take to meet that objective. Recommendations in the Working Safely Guides are one you should consider as you go through your risk assessment process. However, you should also consider if there's anything specific for Scotland, anything specific for your sector, such as maybe produced by a trade union or trade body specific for your industry. So I'd say this is the starting point, but also take other sources into account. Okay, so the guidance begins by asking us to think about risk. If you're an employer, you have a legal responsibility to protect your workers and others from risks to their health and safety. The transmission of COVID-19 is of course a risk to health. This means you need to think about the risks the workers and others face and do everything reasonably practicable to minimise them, recognising you cannot completely eliminate the risk of COVID-19. To help you decide what actions to take, you need to carry out an appropriate COVID-19 risk assessment, just as you would for any other health and safety hazard. If you're not already done so, you should carry out your assessment of the risks posed by COVID-19 in your workplace as soon as possible. If you're currently operating, it's likely you've already gone through a lot of this thinking already. However, we'd recommend you use the available guidance to identify any further improvements you should make. Your risk assessment should be completed in consul consultation with unions or workers. So employers have got a duty to consult their people on health and safety. The people who do the work are often the best people to understand the risks in the workplace and will have a view on how to work safely. So you must consult with the health and safety representative selected by a recognised trade union, or if there isn't one, representative chosen by workers, 
If you're the employer, you cannot decide who the representative will be. If you work in a workplace which has other employers or other contractors sharing one space, then you must work together to coordinate your findings such that everyone is protected. Employers should also consider sharing the results of the risk assessment with the workforce. So this is a bit different between the Scottish guidance and the English guidance. So within the English guidance it advises that you should consider publishing your results online. And if you have more than 50 employees, you would be strongly recommended to publish your results online. The Scottish Government guidance doesn't mention publishing your information. However, it does say that your employees should be engaged throughout, so it would be sensible to at least share the findings with them and get their feedback on how they think the measures work. Other points to notice on the approach on thinking about risk. Within the Scottish Government guidance, the risk assessment being dynamic is a big focus. You have to regularly review and update your assessment. The Scottish Government guidance also advises about the potential requirement to engage with consultancies. If you don't have the expertise in-house, if you don't have the competency or the availability of staff to complete this assessment yourself, then you may wish to consult with other outside help to get you through this process. The Scottish Government guidance also enforces that you should have a focus within your risk assessment on your employees' well-being. Employees should feel comfortable about returning to work and that should be reinforced by clear communication. So in any case, we must think about who should go back to work as part of our assessment. So the objective here is that everyone should work from home unless they cannot work from home. So nothing's changed in that respect. You should still be facilitating home working where you can. But you need to bring some staff back into the in-work activities. We can't carry on as we have been indefinitely. So as part of that, we're going to need to determine who cannot work from home, considering your on-site roles, your business critical roles, and those who require specialist equipment. This is going to vary from sector to sector and business to business. If you've got operational staff, of course they need to be on site in order to carry out their operations. However, what about things like health and safety staff? They may typically spend most of their day in the office and they may be able to carry on working from home part time in at least some capacity. But is it now identifying the need to bring those staff back into the, the workplace to oversee operations and ensure that rules are being followed and non-conformances aren't occurring. You should also think about protecting the, clinic, the, the clinically vulnerable and clinically extremely vulnerable individuals. I'll give some examples of who falls into these groups on the next slide. So clinically vulnerable individuals are at higher risk for severe illness. They have, you've been asked to take extra care in observing social distancing. These individuals should be helped to work from home either in their current role or in an alternative role. If clinically vulnerable individuals cannot work from home, then they should be offered the safest available role on site. To my mind, this means you may need to complete an extra risk assessment for those individuals who fall into this clinically vulnerable category. Individuals who fall into the clinically extremely vulnerable, they're still being advised to work from home where at all possible. And also, um, you have, when you're bringing staff back, you have to make sure that any individuals who've been advised to stay at home due to self-isolating, due to themselves displaying symptoms or another member of their household displaying symptoms, they have to be supported and not come into work. This section's now been updated to include track and trace, to trace and protect. You also have a responsibility to treat everyone in your workplace equally. So when you're thinking about who you bring back, then you need to ensure that you're not discriminating directly or indirectly against anyone because of a protected characteristic such as age, sex or disability. Okay. So as I said, um, I would give an example here. So just to highlight, if you have individuals who would be typically in the shielding group, the clinically extremely vulnerable, the guidance is still to support them in working from home where at all possible. Clinically vulnerable should still be encouraged to remain at home and if they are coming back into site should be given um, the safest option on, on site. Okay. So now on to social distancing. So even this section may be somewhat out of date because we've moved from two metre social distancing wherever possible to in England one metre plus. We're still sticking with two metre wherever we can 
within Scotland. So the guidance advises that we need to maintain social distancing, whatever that is at this time, uh, whenever possible. While arriving at site, departing from site, while in work and travelling between sites. Um, so the guidance gives some pretty good examples here about the type of things you may want to consider. Sorry, let me just say get that one first. Uh, so when you do have activities on your site that social distancing is not possible, you first need to consider, does that activity really need to happen for your business to operate? And then if that act activity is essential for your business to operate, then you must take all mitigating actions possible to reduce the risk of transmission between staff, i.e. complete a task-based risk assessment. So the guidance doesn't explicitly say it, but I think if you were approaching this, you would identify your activities where individuals have to be closer than the recommended distance together, and you would be looking at that task in more detail and laying out what is the procedure in place, what risk measures are currently in place. So the guidance also advises in a pretty exhaustive list a what other steps you might take to maintain social distancing in your workplace. And I think these are the types of things people are more comfortable with, having seen it in the media. So I'll go through this fairly quickly. So you may look to uh, stagger your arrival times and your break times to, break, to eliminate that kind of crush at the start and the end of the day. To put in one-way systems throughout the workplace to avoid that face-to-face -face contact between people, say on staircases. Regulate high traffic areas such as corridors and walkways. That's putting in the markers that we're all getting familiar with seeing outside of the supermarket and so on. Reviewing your layout and work areas and common areas. So that's um, setting which bits of furniture can't be used because they're too close together. Relocating things further apart wherever you can. We should also be looking to limit people's movement around the site. So see if you've got a large site with lots of different process areas and office areas then you should be looking to see how can we have people limited to their area of the business where they need to be to avoid them having to walk the length of the building and pick up something or a file and then walk all the way back. So what else can we do to avoid those unnecessary journeys around site? Can we use things like radios and phones to, adopt, to avoid having to go and talk to people face to face? One addition that I've seen in, in the, um, the guidance which was just added last week was about um, putting measures in place to stop people from having to shout across the workplace. So ha avoiding having radio and playing music at high volume or having people routinely having to shout across back and forth um, because that's seen as being an increased risk of transmission. If you have lifts on site, then you should be restricting your occupancy within these and providing hand sanitizer and advising those who can to use the stairs while still keeping the lifts available for those who can't. Um, you should look to use remote working tools to replace meetings. So I think these Zoom calls and Skype calls are here to stay. Um, you don't want to be getting all your staff into one meeting, one meeting room unless you really have to. If you do have to have your staff in a, a meeting space, then you want to hold your meetings in well-ventilated spaces. Uh, I'll talk about ventilation a bit more later on. And here's some examples here for the Working Safely Guides of what social distancing might look like in the workplace. So this example is for a uh, office space where you can see we've still got a, they've moved the desks slightly further apart so that people can work side by side without being within each other's two meter bubble. People are still sitting face to face and that can't be avoided. So we're using screens um, to permit uh, people to sit face to face where it's not been possible to move workstations further apart. And as you can see there in this example, we've also provided markings on the floor so the other people who are maybe coming over at your desk, they communicate some information, they know how far back they need to stand. We've also got some examples here of some measures which have been put into place in a factory. So this is your two metre markings to show people where to stand um, apart when they're perhaps all working at one workbench. And where we have areas where individuals have to stand closer together, then we're using temporary dividers between individual workstations. So in order to meet these requirements, there's a few things you might need to provide. You might need to provide screens where distancing isn't possible between workstations. You might need to provide additional parking or bike racks to allow workers to avoid public transport on their way to and from work. You might need to provide additional hand washing facilities at entrance points and in lifts. 
at the moment it's currently recommended to regulate canteens and to see if you can provide a uh, pre-packaged food to avoid those high traffic areas. So a few things to consider as well as just your workplace layout. A wee note here on accidents and incidents. So the guidance advises on how to handle accidents and incidents during this time. The guidance is clear that in an emergency, the priority is to respond to the incident, not to maintain social distancing. For instance, administering first aid, social distancing isn't going to be possible. During a fire evacuation, leaving the building cannot be staggered. There may be crowds at the exit points. The guidance, however, advises that you should uh, use additional hand washing measures following a uh, evacuation. There's also specific guidance, but I mentioned first aid there. There's specific guidance for how to respond to an individual who's become unwell with a suspected COVID case. So I would advise you to consult that guidance. You must also consider that your first aiders and your fire wardens are other individuals uh, who will have a position of responsibility. That might be changing a little bit with how different the workplace is going to look going forward. So a few things that we've picked up um, when doing these risk assessments. Um, the use of fire exits is entry and exit points. So um, although we may be putting one-way systems throughout the building, uh, we want to ensure that uh, we aren't holding open fire doors and potentially compromising site security and fire safety. If we're putting in barriers between areas, such as between individual workstations, we want to ensure that those aren't blocking fire exits. We've got reduced occupancy on site, we're reduced headcount. Have we still got enough first aiders? Have we still got enough fire wardens? Have we got the person on site who's responsible for fire and evacuation? So this might identify the need to update your fire risk assessment, your fire strategy and training documents. Okay. So now on to managing contacts. So the objective here is to minimise the number of unnecessary visits to the workplace and make sure people understand what they need to do to maintain safety. So this is individuals to outside of your operation who have to come into your operation. So if we've got visitors coming on site, we must first of all consider, do they need to be there? Can we carry out the work remotely via telephone call? conversation, video conversation, whatever it may be. If you've got essential contractors that need to come into your, your place of business, you should be limiting the number of visitors on site at one time, limiting uh, what times they're on site and restricting what access areas of the site they've got access to. Say you've got a program of work going on that's going to have a lot of contractors on, play, on site at one time, then you're going to look to have a plan in place to reduce the interaction between individuals, reduce that overlap, and consider things like carrying out essential services, equipment and processing at night when your staff aren't present. You should be maintaining a record of all visitors. As I say, when this guidance was first published, I think it was if this is practical. Now we're into the track and trace stage of the virus. That's going to be an essential part. You need to know who's coming to and from your workplace. If you've got visitors coming to your site, you should also be providing them with clean instruction. Before they arrive, you should be sharing them. This is what our risk assessment measures look like. This is how we want you to behave when you come to our site. And this is how you'll behave when you're on our site. We should be focusing on what to do when they arrive. Is there additional um, processes they've got to follow that may be different for the last time they visited? And the individuals who are responsible for handling visitors coming onto site, then they need to know what change there is to their responsibilities. They need to be trained and updated accordingly. We should also be looking to revise our visitor arrangements, even just we daft things like everybody signing in with the same pen as they arrive at the section. Remove the shared pen, remove, the, remove a potential transmission point. Okay, so that's me just a wee bit halfway-ish. So just see if there's any um, questions at the moment. Is there anything at the moment? Yeah, Kelly in the chat anyway. But if anyone does have any questions, um, you can raise your hand, which is in the field to participant. You should see a wee raise hand icon just at the bottom of the list. Um, I had one for you. You were talking about the need to um, record all visitors to and from the premises just there. Yeah. You know how I, I was telling Kelly before that my dad is a publican and obviously they have a, a legal duty to take additional data details about who is attending the, um, the pub and, and that we can track and trace to some extent. Would, 
do you think an employer would have to do that for visitors and um, contractors as well to have a mobile number and other points of data? Yeah, I, I would advise that. I would say having a, a list of who's been on your site and what date and at least having a mobile number is something that you'll be able to track them. Obviously, it, it very much does depend because in certain types of businesses, you may have a very high head count of people coming through your site. And how do you, you manage that? So it's first minimising it and then keeping the records such that we can track them going forward. Great, great. No, I'm just thinking... And I, I believe in terms of... Oh, thinking about GDPR now as well. Yeah, that, that's the next thing. Yeah, that, that's always the next question that gets asked. So I, I think it's always about requesting permission to, to, to take that information. And then um, I believe that the, the time to keep it would be 60 days. And I would imagine that other restrictions in place about not sharing it, uh, unless it's with the, the Public Health Board and not using that information for any other marketing means or anything like that. Again, uh -huh. GDPR expert, but... That, that would be my thinking the best approach would be for this. Um, I've got David Nicol asking if he can add something. Is that all right, Kayleigh? Like, uh, I'll just unmute yeah. him. Is that okay? Right, David, that's you unmuted. Uh, yeah, um, no, the thing is, we, we're doing a bit of work. I think, um, like I'm an AV company, but we're also doing a bit of like a workspace management just now. In terms of the kind of signing thing, is that a lot of companies that that we've been doing stuff as well, we've got the kind of electronic sign in, whereas you go in and it's a, like a like an like an iPad as you go yeah. in. But what you can actually do is is that in terms of uh, managing that, you can actually if somebody's coming to visit, let's say a, an office building, you can send them like a QR code. And basically what they can do is they'll come in with a mobile phone and actually put that on the touch screen. So they don't need to touch the touch the touch screen. It'll read who they are and then send an email to the person that's actually in the building and they can yeah. conduct so that kind of manages that kind of, kind of uh, using technology. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, a good, that's good to know, David, because that, that is what the guidance advises you is to look to see if there's any ways that you could avoid having the, the example they give is people using a touchpad, perhaps, say, to a, a building. Can they then move to maybe a bit more old school if they flash in a badge as they go in? But something like a QR code for a, a contactless entry. Um, it's using the technology and I think especially with people now some of the sites going to be working from home at least for the foreseeable and some people will be on site if that allows a way to track who's on site and who's not even better. Yeah cool thanks. Thank you very much David thank you. Right, so I, I think we'll just we'll kick on but if anyone yeah, does have any questions we'll please do use, the, use the, chat, the chat function and um, um, as I said when it comes when we come to the end we'll if anyone's got any wants to raise their hands, they can do so, and we'll we'll, we'll unmute you there as well. Back yep, with you. Back on them. Okay, so another of the kind of key points to maintaining um, our, our, our secure workplace is um, having a clean workplace. So the guidance advises that before you restart, you need to make sure that your workplace is clean and ready to restart, including clean out, carrying out cleaning procedures and providing hand sanitizer before restarting work. So steps you might need to take there are ensuring all your touch points and surfaces are subject to cleaning before your employees return. I'd make a note here that um, a lot of businesses are going for this deep cleaning fogging. Um, at the moment, the fogging is not required by the government guidance, and if it is carried out, it should be done in conjunction with touch point cleaning, not as a uh, um, complete alternative to. Uh, but fogging might have some benefits, especially when we've got soft furnishings um, to show that we've um, really deeply cleaned them before we restart. And then I'll make a, a note on this ready to restart uh, when I come on to the ventilation system in a few minutes. So then once you've cleaned your workplace and um, ready for restart, then you need to keep it clean. Hard surfaces are still going to be one of our main potential for transmission points. So there's potential for people to transmit the virus by touching contaminated surfaces. So therefore we need to ensure we've got regular cleaning. So frequent cleaning of your work areas, your equipment touch points between uses and using usual cleaning products. If you've got specialist equipment and machinery on site that you can't just clean with typical cleaning products, then you need to determine a cleaning process for them. You can't just say we didn't clean that because we can put the wipes on it or whatever it may be. Also encouraging clear workspaces it's easy to keep your house clean when it's uh, nice and tidy. Uh, same goes for the workplace, encouraging a clear desk policy, if it's an office environment, or um, ensuring that workspaces are kept clear of material that doesn't need to be there, ensuring waste is removed as, uh, as quickly and promptly as we can. So see there's additional specific guidance for cleaning up after a suspected COVID case. 
So I would suggest that you look at the guidance for that. And also another is hand hygiene. So this is one that I think everybody's kind of had uh, battered over the head for the last few months, but it still bears repeating. Um, good hand hygiene throughout the working day is essential for uh, preventing transmission of the virus. So guidance advises about signs and posters. Um, the, the Scottish government guidance suggests potentially using a tannoy throughout the day. Um, I'm not quite sure what the best means is, but I think as we need to keep reinforcing this message in the days and the, the weeks and the months goes on, we might get to get have to get a bit creative about reminding people to really thoroughly wash their hands, how often they need to be doing it, and that it's still important even at this time. Um, so uh, hot soapy water is the preference, but providing hand sanitizers at entrance to rooms um, where we have a go a hand sanitizer available. Uh, we should also set clear use and get cleaning guidance for toilets, be that only having one person in the loose each time. We should provide in waste facilities, so we'll be encouraging people to you know catch it, then it kill it. Um, with sneezes and um, good sneeze hygiene, so ensuring we've got frequent rubbish collection for them. Um, hand drying facilities, so ensuring we've got as part of hand washing that we've got facilities for hand drying. Uh, one of my colleagues actually uh, shared a, a quite an interesting story with me today about lack of hand drying facilities which was at a site, I believe it was in the States, um, where someone had uh, washed their hands, hadn't dried them properly, and then had used an uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, which then was able to ignite on their hands because of it sat on the surface of their hands for longer. Uh, so as an explosion engineer, that was interesting to me. Um, and I'd say there's, within the guidance, there's very specific for handling of packages coming in and out of the workplace. And also if you've got changing rooms or shower rooms on site, what the hygiene procedures for them needs to be. Okay, so this is about inbound and outbound goods. So there's a requirement to maintain your social distancing and avoid surface transmission. So we're talking about high volume situations like distribution centres, dispatch areas, your mail rooms, that type of thing. So it's all what we've been seeing today. It's all about uh, limiting the number of people in the area, ensuring that they've got the appropriate information about how they should behave to behave safely. Um, there's a bit of about potentially reviewing your order frequency and quantity. I think a lot of businesses have probably changed the way their orders are handled anyway because of the change to their business over the, the past few months. Uh, but the guidance would advise, can you look to order things monthly instead of weekly, that type of thing, to avoid having that delivery driver coming to your, your place of work on a weekly basis. But then you've also got to have enough space to safely store things, so consider that as well. Um, as I said earlier about uh, workforce management, if you've got um, operations which require more than one worker, they should be done in fixed teams wherever possible. Um, still a requirement to provide drivers with welfare facilities, including hand wash facilities. However, if possible, and it's delivery drivers, you can encourage them to stay in the vehicle where it's possible and safe to do so. Okay, now a little bit on PPE, and I'm going to get my notes up here just to make sure to get this right. So the guidance and the use of gloves, face masks and face coverings has been quite mixed and a bit confusing over the last few months um, for a lot of people. So I would just advise, first of all, that where you already use PPE in your work activity to protect against non-COVID-19 risks, you should continue to do so. So this is if you need to use respirators or dust masks uh, that isn't affected by COVID and you should continue to do that if the activity requires it as part of your non-COVID risk assessment. And the HSE has also provided some specific guidance for the use of this PPE um, during this time. So that's things around how to fit your respirators and um, the use of disposable respirators for one use. So now on to uh, the use of PPE for the COVID outbreak. So when managing the risk of COVID-19, additional PPE beyond what you would usually wear is not beneficial. The exception of clinical settings and selected other settings because COVID-19 is a different type of risk from what you'd normally face and must be managed through our social distancing, our hygiene and our fixed teams, not through the use of PPE. So it's currently advised that workplaces should not encourage the precautionary use of extra PPE to protect against COVID-19 outside the clinical settings responding to a suspected case and in case of um, some specific requirements there. So unless you're in a situation which meets these specialist requirements, such as a clinical setting, your risk assessment should reflect that the role of PPE as an additional protection is extremely limited. 
the PPE is, as always, the last line of defence. And supplies of PPE should be maintained for those who, um, who, who require it within a medical setting. But I'd say it's a little bit of confusion between what, what's a PPE, what's a face mask, and what's a face covering. So there are some circumstances where wearing a face covering is marginally beneficial as a protective measure. So at the moment within Scotland, it's currently mandated that we must wear face coverings in shops and we must wear them in public transport. And that's because in these situations, social distancing might not always be possible. However, within the workplace, we should be putting in a full, proper risk assessment process such that social distancing is possible in the majority of circumstances. So we shouldn't be relying upon face coverings within the workplace. And that's the message we're getting from the HSE at this time. However, employees may choose to adopt face coverings due to their own personal choice. And if they do choose to adopt face coverings, then they should be supported in doing so. But it's optional and not required by law. So if people are choosing to adopt face coverings, and I would say this also applies for trips to the supermarket and, and trips on the bus or the train as well, um, they should be used properly. You should wash your hands before putting them on and taking them off. So if you have employees who may choose to adopt face coverings or you're in a setting where the public are having to adopt face coverings, then you need to tell your workers how to wash their hands thoroughly before and after. Um, about not touching their face because it's just potentially going to contaminate it and potentially be a potential source of transmission. You need to change your face covering if it gets damp. You need to continue to wash your hands regularly. A face covering does not mean you can ignore the hand hygiene. And it needs to be changed and washed daily. The material is washable. It needs to be washed in line with manufacturer's instructions. That can often include the requirement to iron the garment. And you should still be continuing to practice social distancing wherever possible. It's something I've seen in my experience now, having been doing these assessments now for a few months and going on to various sites, is in some sites there's an over-reliance upon face coverings and therefore the other aspects of social distancing and risk assessment aren't being followed as well as they should have been. And then, you know, people don't wear the masks properly, they pull them down, their nose is out, they're touching them all the time, if anything, it's potentially creating a hazard. Okay, so just a bit on workforce management before to wrap up these about the guidance. So workforce management, I've alluded to this earlier, it's about changing the way work is organised to limit the number of contacts people have. We talked about limiting people's roles to certain geographical areas within the site. That also means limiting the number of individuals they come into contact with. So that might be having fixed teams, remove direct object passing using a pick up and put down area. Sorry, that slides on there twice for some reason. And there's also some guidance within this section, which has just newly been added, and that is to provide guidance in the event of a COVID outbreak. What do you do if you get a COVID-19 outbreak in your workplace? So the steps advised are to have a plan in place and have that as part of your risk assessment. Maintain up-to-date contact details for your employer, employees and your visitors. Nominate a point of contact in your workplace to liaise with the public health if you get an outbreak in the workplace. And as per the, the current guidance is, if you have more than one case, then that's when you need to be liaising with the public health. And at that point, they may declare an outbreak and they, you will then have to work with the public health to assist with identifying the contacts that you've made. So message there would be, um, have a plan in place on how to respond to a COVID-19 outbreak in your workplace, be that one case or more. Maintain up-to-date contacts and have someone within your organisation who's responsible for being that point of contact with public health. Okay, so now on to communication. So we need to make sure that all workers understand the COVID-19 related safety procedures. So we need to have clear, consistent and regular communication. We need to tell people what the changes to their way of working is going to be and why they're having to do it. We need to engage with the workers and workplace worker representatives. So you might have put in a step that you're thinking is going to be a really clever way to manage the COVID risk in your workplace and your employees will tell you actually that's meaning that I'm working closer to this person than I was before or you haven't thought about this part of the task, how am I meant to overcome that? 
So I'd say communicating with your work, workforce and updating your assessment is becoming more and more critical, especially as the guidance continues to evolve. The guidance also advises that you should communicate and train your workers prior to them returning to site, particularly in what they need to expect as they arrive on site. So if you're bringing staff back from furlough, they should have a heads up in advance, this is what it's going to look like in the workplace, um, and this is how I need to behave in this new workplace. And then once staff are back, they need to ensure they're kept up to date with the safety measures and how they've been updated and implemented. So that's continuing to engage with the workers. As you see, there's a focus on mental health, ensuring that there's um, a good level of engagement with employees, both those employees who have returned to work and those who have continued to work from home. And for that, we should use the simple, clear messaging, ensure it's very clear what everyone needs to do. If you have um, sites which have got multiple nationalities in them, then use pictograms where possible, translate signs where necessary, ensure that everyone is aware of what's expected of them to do in the workplace. And also using visual communication. So we want to avoid this need to have face-to-face -face meetings and briefings throughout the day. So where possible, use um, visual communication to communicate the findings of the assessment. And also sharing the experience, share with your suppliers, your customers, your trade bodies. We're all facing a very unique challenge here. So now's the time to find out how are other people doing things. If you've come up with something quite novel in your workplace that you think really works, shout about it and, and give other people a hand. Okay. okay, so just quickly on restart. So as I said, within the cleaning section of the Working Safely Guides, it mentions that you should ensure that your systems are ready to restart and you should have an assessment for all sites or parts of the site that have been closed before restarting work. So this includes heating and ventilation systems. So you, the guidance advises you should check whether you need to service or adjust ventilation systems to ensure that they don't, for instance, reduce duty, reduced occupancy on site. And it then advises that most air conditioning systems don't need to be adjusted. However, where a system serves multiple buildings or you're unsure, advice should be sought from an engineer or advisor. The question we would ask there is how do you know if your system falls into the category of most air conditioning systems? Are you confident to make that judgment or would you want to liaise with a, um, a specialist? So if you were to ask the expert here, we would likely direct you to these two guidance documents by SIBSE, um, who have put in um, some pretty specific prescriptive guidance about what's to happen with ventilation systems. So SIBSI have advised that you should not continue to use um, central recirculation systems. There's a potential to transmit um, particles with, of the virus from one area of the building to another via central recirculation system. So these should not be operating at this time. The HSE advisors have also updated to say that the risk of air conditioning spreading coronavirus is extremely low and you can continue to use most types of air conditioning systems as normal, but if you have a centralised ventilation system that removes and circulates air to different rooms, it's recommended you turn off recirculation and use of fresh air supply. So SIBSI and the HSE are now in agreement on this. If you have a central research system, you want to um, avoid that and have fresh air only going through the building. If you have something like a local recirculation system, it's likely it's going to be okay. Um, but I would say have a look at the guidance to see if you have one of these types of systems. Similarly for heat recovery, have a bit of a closer look at it. Okay, so what's the, the, the impact there? If you are to turn off your HVAC system or turn off your recirculation, well, you're certainly going to be using a, a lot more energy because you're not getting that heat recovery step, but you're having to constantly bring in cold Scottish air into the building. What about if you're having to rely upon natural ventilation, such as opening windows and shutting internal doors? Simply basically accept that it's going to be colder and people aren't going to be comfortable and aren't going to be happy, but you might need to adjust the dress codes and adjust people's expectations about what the workplace is going to feel like going forward. Uh, just a, a note on some other issues you might face when re reopening a building that's maybe not been occupied for, for a certain length of time. Um, so you may be now opening with reduced occupants. So water within your systems might be stagnant. You might need to review your Legionella controls if that's something that you'd consider previously. You may need to check your toilet flushing regime. If you have a site that produces trade effluent, 
it might typically be diluted by your normal water use on site, your sinks and your toilets. Um, if that's not currently being uh, used, then you might need to review your trade consent. Waste management, so I talked about more frequent emptying of bins for tissues and that type of thing, but you might be reducing less waste if you're re producing less materials. So um, how can you, you might need to renegotiate your waste management basically. And as I said, changes to your heating and ventilation system, um, that might lead to drafts in the workplace, variations in temperature range. You're also going to have less people in the workplace, so that might affect the way a building feels when you've got a large open plan space, which is now perhaps we've got a few individuals working in it. So just a few things to consider as part of your restart. Okay, so what's next? Once you've completed your risk assessment process and you've got these measures in place, what do you do next? So in England, it would advise that you pre present this poster and display it in your workplace to show that your workplace is COVID secure. It's not required by the Scottish Government guidance, but um, it's not advising that you don't do it either. And certainly COVID-19 secure is the terminology that the Health and Safety Executive are using, which I'm going to mention in a minute. And they say, uh, once you've completed your risk assessment, you're going to look to share it with your workforce at least. You may wish to share it with the public and maybe part two, give your clients um, and your supply chain more comfort that you are ready for business and might be something you're looking to do anyway. Enforcement. So the HSE can enforce non-conformance with COVID-19 guidance under the Management Health and Safety at Work regs. Now the Health and Safety Executive has begun to do checkups in businesses. So this is a combination of site visits, phone calls, arranging site visits um, and uh, ensuring requesting information via uh, photographs and via videos. So if you have the HSE on site for another issue, maybe it's a coma intervention visit scheduled or they're following up to a previous issue, the first thing they're likely going to ask is, show me a copy of your COVID-19 risk assessment. Anecdotally, we've heard that the HSE are intend to visit all major accident sites. So in the unlikely case you fall into one of those, expect a visit in the near future. So from the HSE website, the common issues that they are finding at the moment is failure to monitor your social distancing measures. So maybe you've done the right thing, you've put your tape on the floor, you've put your one-way system in, but how do you know that people are actually following it? So you need to ensure you're monitoring those measures going forward. Another one is inadequate cleaning regime, particularly during busy periods. So did you put in a cleaning schedule and clean everything for everyone coming back, but as soon as things get busy, it falls by the wayside. And lack of welfare facilities for hand washing has been highlighted as another concern of the HSEs at the moment. So the HSE will take action um, from providing advice and issuing enforcement notices. I think we're going to get a bit of leeway here, provided we're showing that we're, we're taking the right steps and they'll work with us on it. They're not going to be dishing out enforcement fines. However, if you're showing that you've not made any effort, then they're going to come down on you. And they've got the ability to do that to lead to prosecution. Okay, so what problems might you face in carrying out your risk assessment? So I think I've uh, mentioned this a few times today, as a moving target, the UK and Scottish government guidance has continuously been updated and it can be really, really difficult to keep on top of it. Where are we now? What is the latest? Am I doing the right thing? It seems to have changed since last week. So it's quite difficult to get your head around it at first and then keep, make sure you're keeping on top of it. Another would say is time pressure. So we're trying to complete this risk assessment, take the action and communicate your findings to your workers before you bring people back to work and ensuring they're kept up to date going forward. And then you'll have other time pressures on as well. Well, we want to get production back online. We want to be getting the sales back in. You might also identify the need for further assessment. So we carry out that first assessment and we identify a bunch of activities which don't permit social distancing. Or we identify a few individuals who are working from home who are at, at particular risk. If we want to bring those individuals back, where are they going to go within the workplace? How are we going to handle that? So we might identify further work required. So with that in mind, what support is available? As I said, there's a wealth of guidance out there, but we can provide some support in either carrying out your risk assessment for you, be that coming at your site, telling you what you need to do based on your individual workplaces to manage social distance and hygiene and workforce management. Or if you've already completed an assessment and you would like you know, impartial expert advice to review that you've done the right thing, that's certainly something we can support with. And we can also provide advice and support with the other restart issues, um, such as we're heating and ventilation issue I mentioned, or changes to your energy consumption, changes to your waste and water issues. 
So off the back of today's uh, webinar, we are offering free 15 minute phone consultations for anyone who wants, you know, just have a chat about uh, what you may be put in place or a specific issue in your workplace or even just wants a steer on where to start with this. Um, so if that's something that anyone would be interested in, uh, my colleague Suzanne Lindsay's contact details are on the screen and we'd be more than happy to get that set up with you. So I'll leave that up on the screen just now and we can just have a look and see if there's anything in the chat. So I know Kirsty had a question, I think. Um, she, you sort of covered it just towards the end there, just about the speed of communicating with your employees to the return, really. Um, is there a sort of minimum requirement? So say I communicate with my employees tomorrow, would it be a week before they're due back? Is there any sort of guidance? The, the, the guidance that? is just before they come back. And even then, it can be they, they're you know, given a heads up they what to expect in advance and then I know a lot of operational sites which were you know some of the first ones back factories and such uh, how they chose to handle this was um, give people the kind of headline item in advance and then when they return back it was this is the COVID-19 measures and as well as a refresh of all their other health and safety particularly now when we're coming into individuals may have been out of the workplace for months at this stage uh -huh. so, uh, maybe as they come back into the workplace they're getting a refresher on not just this COVID hazard but all the other hazards which they're expected to manage in their workforce. So I'd say um, yep, advisor in advance of them coming back and then potentially a new a refresher course upon return. Super, I've got I another sort of question of my own, just, but if anyone does have a question either just raise your hand and I'll unmute you or you can pop it into the chat but um, I was listening to you talking there, and obviously this has moved on a lot since we did the, the one of um, yeah. the people, I think, actually. And then um, I was just saying that you noticed there at the end that you said the HSE, when they're monitoring, sort of identifying that some of the issues are coming from employers monitoring social distancing. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, is that, that sort of places a burden on the employer to keep track of the whole thing constantly then? So Yeah, so we're, so we're taking this from... It. It's a, it's a dynamic risk assessment and um, you document your risk assessment with your main measures that you're going to put in place. What is your plan? And then you need to check that that plan's been followed and act to improve it if it's not. Uh -huh. So I think a lot of places were really enthusiastic, a lot of sites have been enthusiastic and have followed the guidance at the beginning. Um, but then people become complacent. Of course they do. Um, people start moving closer and closer together. So it's just reinforcing that with clear and consistent messaging and ensuring that people understand the importance of it going continuously forward. So there is definitely the um, responsibility continues to lie with the employer through the management of that measures. Super. Alison, raise like, your hand. Oh, sorry, Alison's got a hand raised, did you see? Oh, yep. Yeah. I know Alison, I'll just unmute you now, Alison, there you go. Hi there, um, it was just, I, I'm obviously, I'm the business service manager at the Glasgow Chamber, um, so, we're obviously, as well as helping the membership, we're having to look at our own office. Now it's a very old office um, in George Square. So we don't have big open spaces. We have lots of small offices. So that's going to be a problem trying to fit everybody in or mm -hmm. even a few people in at the moment where the commercial team and myself and the chief executive sit, there's, about 10 of us squashed into a very small area. And a lot of us are sit sort of back to back. Mm -hmm. um, so how would that work with the social distancing, you know, with if you were back to back with people? Um, so, so, so back, I would, I would say first of all, I can sympathise with, with the office layout that you describe it. It's very similar to what we have at, at Mavit House in Glasgow. So we've got an, an old mansion house with individual rooms, which maybe have between four and seven people in each room. And then you look at the footprint and you think you know, we have two or three in that space uh, based on the footprint. Um, so first of all, we're looking to see, can you continue to do home, home working where possible? Yeah. To limit the number of people being on site or potentially limit the number of people in the office at any one time. Um, and then having you know allocated a number of maximum occupants per office. I'd say back to back working that you're describing is preferred if we can't maintain social distancing at all times. A side to side working and back to back working is preferable to face to face. We've got face to face, we need the screens. So I would say, yeah, first of all, uh, still minimise number of people in an office at one time, manage that number of maximum occupants and um, yep, discourage face-to-face -face working where you can. Yeah. So does there need to be a distance between the chairs if they're back-to-back? -back? 
Um, so, I believe we still need to try and maintain. Um, it's more around yeah. minimising, uh, setting a maximum number of people in that office. Yeah. So you probably wouldn't be able to go back up to your, your eight or whatever. It no, no. Um, but yeah, hopefully I'm right on that. I'll maybe take it aside and just get back to you on that because it's been a while since I looked at the social distancing section. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, also, just, you know, with the flow of the office, it's just, you know, you've got to consider all that as well. So Yeah, you've got to think about your toilets and your yeah, so room like, and your staircases and, and, and yeah. that type of thing. You just um, haven't signed a job to advise um, the number of people that can use an area at any one time. And then, you know, trusting people to... You use a bit of common sense and judgment in that as well. If there's already one person making a cup of tea, they can wait a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. And also, we do encourage, I know you mentioned about clear desk policies, and this is specifically targeted to Alan. We do, <laughs> we do encourage, as before we were coming back into the office, that we allocate a time for everybody to come in so that they can clear their workspaces. Yeah, I think that does seem like quite a, a sensible approach. Um, so I think in our offices, uh, the, the place looks a bit like it's been ransacked at the moment because everybody went in and got their monitors and, and everything as the lockdown continued. Um, so we've already got a, somewhat a clear desk in our office. Um, but yeah, I think um, getting the, the office fully deep cleaned, um, it, it, how do you do that then? Do you, do you get the office cleaned first and then you encourage a clear desk policy going forward perhaps, um, rather than having people going in to, to touch it, everything, and, and touching when it before it's had the cleaning step done. I'm not quite sure about what's the uh, the best order to do things there. Yeah, but you sort of maybe in the next wee while just kind of encourage people maybe just to go in just to take their personal belongings off their desks and things like that. Because yeah. if we come back, when we come back, we're going to be sort of hot desking more. Yes, uh, well, I, I mean, with the hot desk and things, quite interesting as well because have it, that's that's going kind to of against what the, the train is to have fixed workstations um, and keeping those workstations clean, right. uh, avoid having the hot desk. But I appreciate what you're saying. If you've only got an allocated number of desks, which can be used for an allocated number of people, how do you manage that? Um, so it's a tricky one. Yeah, just something okay. we need to give some more thought to. Well, Alan, consider yourself warned for having a messy desk. Oh, that's what happens um, <laughs> when you want to get over. So um, thank you, Alison, and thank you for getting that in too. Um, I'm actually going to unmute David again, if that's all right, David, because I think you were talking about a possible suggestion here um, with the use of sensors, and um, I'll just bring you in if that's all right. Yeah, no problem. The reason for me coming on the call today was, I think as we are doing a lot of work with, with businesses and, and is using technology to get back in, and uh, what the one of the things we're doing is, is like it was mentioned, there was actually desk booking. So what it does, it starts like with with an app, and what you do is you give the employees uh, access to this app, and then they can book their desk uh, prior to coming in. And that's quite a simple way of doing it, but it, you can take it on uh, stages further than that. By actually putting in things like occupancy sensors under a desk, which actually means you can actually see when they're there real time. Uh, and also occupancy sensors in the building, which can actually count people. And actually, you can actually do it so you can actually make sure that people actually stay to that distance as well. Now, it's how you actually uh, engage with the employees after that to say, like, it may be there may be an instance where there's been 120 instances in that day where people came too close together. And it's how you communicate that. Do you have somebody that's like a, a warden that will actually email people out and say, look, you're not doing this right, guys. We need to, this is the instance we've had. Or do you put it in digital displays running about the building? Um, there's very various, various ways of doing it. I think with technology, and I think I'm I'm interested in how actually people are tackling it. So that when I can speak to people about what we do, it's, it's, it's actually getting the right kind of terminology and actually try to solve the problems that I've actually got. Because one of the things we actually got was occupancy in toilets. Because the thing is, that if you get into, a, into a toilets and maybe get six cubicles. How do you make sure that people aren't piling into the toilet areas and stuff as well? Yeah. So one of the solutions yeah, was I put in occupancy sensors in there um, to actually just count people in and out and then just put a screen outside the door to say, right, is it capacity or there's four people in here? It's, it's that kind of idea and that things can be solved, solved in that way. Yeah, Thank David, you. I've seen um, a bit more kind of low-tech solutions, I suppose, with the, um, the occupancy thing, perhaps with the toilets, the same. 
um, one person in, even if it's a block of six, because usually they've got a double door for you coming in, so you, you potentially have got that face-to-face -face contact. And then using, um, say, something to say occupied, then maybe a slider to avoid having to touch it with your hand, and it'd be creating a, 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 a touch point. Um, but yeah, something like uh, tracking, particularly in kind of large open plan offices. So some of the, the risk assessments we've completed today are for office spaces, which would maybe typically be occupied previously by 500 staff. And yep. that's where I see that the benefit of the type of um, system, as you mentioned here, that that's where I could see that they would uh, potentially be interested in something like that. We're saying yeah. after, I would say. No, definitely. I think it's just to touch on it. When you mentioned the city chambers, I think is what one, uh, I say talk to the city council at the minute is one of them and obviously a couple of other councils as well so that might develop over, over time uh, we'll see we'll see David? Right. I'm just really conscious of the time and I'm yeah, sure a lot of people do have questions it's really five past but it's five past three just now already um, so what we'll do is we will share the video of this presentation and the slides with everyone. Yeah, absolutely, Alan. If you're, uh, there's quite a lot of content in it to try and cover, and uh, so some of it maybe wasn't as, as clear as I would have liked. So I would recommend them. Um, I'll, I'll just send you the slides again uh, once I've okay. got a little duplicate. And slide. what we'll do is we'll put Bailey's and Mabbit's details in there, and feel free to give them a shout if you do have any questions specific. I'm sure Bailey will be delighted to point you in the right direction. Anyway, absolutely, yeah. well. Um, just before I sign off, I noticed Robert um, has put up a, maybe an example of good practice um, where he's, he spotted a few um, people putting up social, on their social media some walkthroughs of their premises so that people know what they're coming to, whether that be staff or their clients and customers as well, so they know what to get when they get there. Yeah, I, th I think that's great. And I've, I've seen that myself. I think it was a, a whiskey site showed their, their shop that was ready for reopening. Um, to try and, and kind of give people the confidence that they were open for business, that it's safe to return. And that's what this is going to be about, is instilling the confidence in people that it is safe yeah. to return to the workplace. So just on behalf of everyone, Kelly, can I say a big thank you to, to you for taking us through that. I know there was loads to cover and loads of material today as well. And please do get in touch if you have any questions. We would be delighted to try our best to help you as well. And to thank you for joining us today. I hope you've found today quite useful. Um, and um, as I said, we'll make sure we share everything with you, the video, the slides, and um, any guidance that we can find, we'll, we'll send across to you as well. But do get in touch as well. But on that, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I do hope to see you all again soon.